And I also feel that when it comes to speaking, a lot of the mistakes I see are because people are spending way too much time thinking about themselves, that they're nervous, they've got to get their credentials out, they've got to say their hellos, they've got like there's this kind of again conditioned way that we have been taught to communicate with our audience. Welcome to The Matt Stone Show, where we help managers become leaders through the power of human connection. We talk with thought leaders, experts, and fellow travelers about the stories and behaviors that will accelerate you toward your true leadership potential. Not that long ago, I don't know about you, but when when I talked about being a speaker or when I thought about being a speaker, what came up for me was standing on a stage. Maybe there's a podium, but at least there's a microphone and an audience, you know, anything from a wedding toast to a business talk to a graduation speech. But one thing that social media, I think, has accelerated and revealed, in my view, is the reality that we're all speakers, that speaking has a broad definition, and that being able to present our ideas in whatever forum, whether it's a small meeting or a large audience format, but being able to present our ideas clearly, concisely, confidently, and in a compelling manner are all absolutely critical to success, whatever that looks like for you. So today I am thrilled to bring you my conversation with Meredith Grundy. Meredith is a renowned speaking coach. She was at Second City Improv uh, as a teacher. She shares her vibrant journey from being a shy student in the back of the classroom to becoming a confident speaker, inspiring leaders worldwide. So whether you're an aspiring speaker, a seasoned presenter, or someone looking just to improve your day-to-day communication skills, this episode is packed with insights that you don't want to miss. Stay tuned as we explore practical tips and heartfelt stories that will transform how you approach speaking and leadership. Let's get into it. And uh, so every time before I'd get on stage, I would do push-ups. And there was one time where I got the whole cast to do it with me. And we would add a push-up for every show. <laughs> oh, you um, do push-ups. That was super wow. fun. Okay, add a push-up for every show. Yeah, I do push-ups, but I count out loud so that the so that it dropped my voice drops to my diaphragm. Oh, so while you're doing the push up, you're you're counting one. Going, one. Yeah. Two. Three. Yeah. Full voice. And then uh the other thing I love to do is breathing exercises to regulate my vagus nerve okay. a little bit. And then I will they, like I get so much energy. Uh I will run in place. I get really chatty. So I have to <laughs> I have to find a way to like pull back and just breathe like a cool, calm cucumber. What's the most afraid Mm -hmm. you've ever been or anxious, you know, in a performance, like as you're starting? That's a really good question. There was a performance that I did. There's two performances that come top of mind. Uh, The first one was where I was pretty much holding down the whole show. I was the lead. I was in every single scene and I was playing a mother who just lost their child and it was called God's ear. And there was a lot of repetition. It was very poetic. It wasn't like a very, it wasn't written in a linear way. And that was challenging. That was very challenging because of the repetition and the, the poetic, the poetic, ness of it. I just invented a word. And then the other show was the first time I ever experienced anxiety on stage. And the name of that show is called Faith. And what would happen, I was also again playing a mother and there was a scene that I would get so nervous leading up to that I my ears would clog up on stage and it was like as if everything was muffled and I had a very difficult time hearing the other actors and being present. It was awful. So those are the two, the two things that came top of mind when you asked that question. I'm imagining like being underwater. Yeah. Like you go underwater, like that. you can't quite hear and see and you're disoriented and then, yeah. Yep. And how do you break yeah. out of that? What do you do? 
I try not to panic. I mean, I, there's nowhere to go. I have to stay on stage and commit mm-hmm. to it and say my lines in the best way that I can. And uh, so that's how I negotiated it. I don't know if there was like a special trick that I used to get out of it. I did notice that I would it would disappear and then it would come back. It was very inconsistent and it was definitely – in the moment, I didn't think it was anxiety. It, I didn't realize it was an anxiety until way after the fact. I went, "Oh my god, that was my body's response to stress." Because yeah. there was this, yeah, because there was this. Per, for some reason, the scene, the way it was staged, the way uh, I, everything about it was just stressful for me, <laughs> and I never felt like I was like nailing it. You know, it's it's. I'm I'm seeing another benefit to doing speaking because it will show you things about how your body, which might be a little bit different than someone else, responds in a high anxiety situation. What kind of awkward way that it, because you know, our bodies will always force us to look at things like skin problems. Yeah. I, I I have really bad skin <laughs> issues when I'm when my stress yeah. peaks. Um, and that's more of a chronic thing. That's not like in a moment, like an acute, you're talking about an acute anxiety, I don't want to say attack, but a moment maybe. Uh, where, well, yeah. I would, yeah. yeah, yeah, it was. But I would say I would go. I would take a step back to Matt and say that it was accumulative. It was cumulative. It was. I feel like there was something about the process itself no. that I was stressed out about, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it, and so that's where it led to. Uh. Because I've been on stage many, many, many times, and I'm an improviser, and I like most stuff doesn't bug me, like. If there's a set piece yeah. missing, bring it on. Like I find that a challenge, but I feel that it can be cumulative. So that's something to look at. I don't know if it is acute. I don't know if it it is. Like maybe it is. That's a really great question that you Well, posed. now you've got me going down a philosophical rabbit hole about, you know, is anything <laughs> acute or is it all a, a, a symbol of something that's been accumulating, you know? Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah. I don't. What's the... I don't, it's, it, Sorry. yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm curious in, in that, I guess in any moment, but like what's, how do you establish your relationship with the audience? What are, As the person on stage, what are you seeing, feeling, and experiencing with an audience that tell, that gives you the signals you need to, mm. are you even reacting based on the audience? Or, you know, I mean, I, I think probably yes, but tell me about how you establish a relationship with an audience in the beginning and what that means to any kind of performance speaking or otherwise. Yeah. I feel like it's allowing yourself to feel connected first before you even open your mouth. And I feel that a lot of people fail to do that because of nerves, because they weren't coached properly, uh, whatever the case might be. And also I feel that we are conditioned to be uncomfortable with space And so we feel that we need to immediately fill that space or we won't be compelling. We won't be entertaining. We won't be uh, inspiring or or whatever. But I feel that it's really allowing yourself to take that time to take in your audience, to feel the energy in the room. And then once you're able to feel that energy, then that's when you can start to begin because that's where the relationship starts with the audience And I also feel that when it comes to speaking, a lot of the mistakes I see are because people are spending way too much time thinking about themselves, that they're nervous, they've got to get their credentials out, they've got to say their hellos, they've got like, there's this kind of, again, conditioned way that we have been taught to communicate with our audience and each audience is so uniquely different that we we need to take that time and space to figure out what is unique about this audience and how is it that when I first walk on stage, I can connect with them best so that they have the best experience and I can better connect mm. with them. Wow. Okay. That audience connection is a whole, it's a, it's a category in and of itself that I am deeply curious about. <laughs> I have some other questions though. I want to maybe revisit that because I was just thinking about, 
are there names for different audiences? Are there is in the industry, oh. you know, do you have like, oh, the, oh, this is a blah, blah audience or this is a like, is there are there categories that professionals kind of know about sort of archetype audiences? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I, I, I don't know so much in the world speaking world. They feel, um, I feel like it depends on the event itself and how that's curated and because that dictates how people also show up. And then there's people in their different industries and the way that they have learned to communicate with each other. So I feel like there's a whole lot going on there in the, performance world, I, re, I I do know like a matinee audience is very different than an evening audience. Like you can feel the matinee audience. You're like, is anybody out there? You know, it's like, are we alive? Uh, and then I feel too, having done comedy, those audiences can vary as well. Like you can get, oh God, I d- I've done late night shows where people have rolled in after a game and they're drunk and their attention spans are all over the place and they're hecklers. And then I've done shows where the audience is like just rolled in from Iowa and they don't know where they landed or how they got there, but they're supposed to somehow interact. (laughs) Like, I don't know. It's, uh, that, that is, and that is where I feel the gift of Noticing in the moment where people are at is so huge. If you can cultivate that, you're golden. I was thinking about like the most successful stand-up comedians when they've built up a, a, a brand and a relationship with their fans. Yeah. And all they have yeah. to do is walk out on the stage and cock their head a certain way and everyone erupts in laughter, right? They, because there's money in the bank. Yeah. There's an expectation about what they're going to yeah. get. The, the audience is self-selected. You know, a matinee audience that's like, oh, there's a, hey, free comedy shows, you know, on the streets of New York, you know, they're always handing out, hey, you want to go see some comedy? And you might have like an audience that wants to heckle. Like that's actually what it doesn't, you could be anybody on that stage if they don't know you. And they're, they, it's, that's the fun for them is heckling you. It doesn't, yep. so your worth yep. can't be defined by that. It's just, you got to accept, what I'm hearing you say is connect with your audience, understand it, and, and work with that, whatever, whatever that is. Yeah. Cause meet, meet them, them where, where they're, they're at. at. Yeah. Meet them where they're at. You know, okay. Here. And, and there's a, there's a, there's a significant difference between a, a, a performance, like a, a written devised, whatever, like a play, right. Or a Broadway show, for example, or, and a comedy and improv or stand up. right. A stand up comedian has the opportunity to meet their audience where they're at. If they just bombed their last joke, they better have another one on their in their back pocket to, to bring it back, right? Some comedians fail at doing that, especially I watched, I, I've sat at like a lot of open mic nights and some of them are just relentless. They're like, oh no, this is, this shit's good. I'm just going to continue with this shit. Like they love, they love my misogyny. Yeah, yeah. You know, like he's like, dude, read the room. A pin could drop and we could hear it right now. Like you need to drop that. <laughs> like, pivot. But when you're in performance, and this is where I feel, I was just listening to Rick Rubin's book, The the uh, Creative Act. And if you haven't read it, please do. It's just a brilliant book. And I'm actually ordering the hard copy. So I have that as well. But there was something he said about audiences and being a artist, which is half your audience is going to like your work and half your audience isn't going to like your work. And that's okay. Um because an artist is creating something that is truly coming from heart and soul and they're putting it out there and it's not going to resonate with everybody. Now, I feel it's similar to being a speaker. However, I feel it's more geared towards how are you going to serve and add value to your audience? And granted, not everyone in that audience is going to resonate with you or your message and or like you, and that's okay too. But I would say it's not. it's less about you you want more of your audience on board with you, I feel, as a speaker than if you're an artist and here's – it's very subjective in that way. Mm. So I hope that was the, clear. But that that just got me thinking, too, about how to guide people and audience connection. So this is really great because I, I was – before, you know, as in the days that 
leading up to this opportunity to connect with you in this format, I've been thinking about where where the Venn diagram of like performer and all the different types of performer, you know, improv and yeah. as you said, stand up comedians and, and all the other things, scripted shows, things like that. Um, and then, you know, the professional public speaking engagement, the leader speaking to the company, speaking to an interviewer or whatever, whatever it is. So where do those two things cross? And you help do that now quite brilliantly. But let me just, I'm not, I'm going to switch gears, but not completely. Okay. <laughs> it's yeah. all interconnected. Okay. I mean, that's okay. the beauty of, of you and the experience you have is you, you're so good to pivot and connect things that so connect. So thank you for that. Um, tell me more about Marsha Johnson from the sixth grade. Marsh. You're the, the girl that you admired. She was amazing. I, I read this on your LinkedIn profile. You talked about Marsha, 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 Marsha. And you, and you Marcia, were this girl Marcia, in the back of the room, like afraid to speak up. And Marsha was up there doing her thing. That's so. You said you said Marsha. I was like, who is this person that we're about yeah. to talk about? Because I changed her last name because of, course. of you know. Okay, so I. That's why if I look okay. like a deer in the let me try it again. First, Tell me about Marsha yeah. Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Johnson. Uh, there was this group of popular girls in my school and I just remember I desperately wanted to be like them. Like they, they were very clicky. They were all wearing brand name clothes. They knew about Madonna before I did, you know, like they were the cool kids and they were always so confident. And there was one, one girl in my class in particular, Marsha, who was tall and she seemed to, everyone seemed to gravitate towards her and she sat in the front row and had no problem raising her hand and answering questions. And I was the kid who sat in the back row and was so shy and paralyzed by the idea of even sharing my voice because I was really afraid of not having the right answer or sounding stupid. Uh, so that's what I did. I hid a lot. And it, it was really just myself and my friend Mona Meta. And I, the two of us would just like hang out together. And that's where my safety was and talk about our sticker collections. Sticker collections. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. We had the friendship bracelets. Oh, yeah. We had the oh, stickers. You're taking me we back. Had- and You're taking time, me back. I am. And at that time, I had my Madonna oh, yeah. glove and my little Madonna headband with the big bow. Uh, I was as awkward as all awkward could be. I mean, my daughter's the same age as I was then now. And she is so confident. I'm like, I wish I had what you had, <laughs> you know, or what you yeah. have, I should say. Well, you know, and you went from that to being in the Second City troupe, uh, comedy troupe, um, which is improv, right? Um, yeah, I taught, taught at the Second, Second City, City for four years. I, I taught yeah. at Second City, yeah. So, yeah. and now, you, and you help primarily leaders, but people in businesses to become confident, clear, effective, persuasive speakers. So, yeah. what an incredible, I mean, there's a lot more to it, but for time's sake, that's, that's what we're dealing with here. <laughs> people. <laughs> it's a yeah, I went from, I went from, I can't speak to, uh, now I speak all the time and I use the wrong words in the wrong context and I mess up stuff all the time, but I've given myself grace around it. I'm like, this is just, this is who I am. This is the brain I got and the body I got. <laughs> like here we are. Well, and the other thing is we're just our harshest critics. I mean, you, you know, from the outside, really it's are. like, you're, you're amazing in every way, you know, and, and yet that troll inside of you that goes, you got nothing to say. You're yeah. not good enough. There's always there's that that person's way. Marsha's way better than I am. You know. <laughs> yes, we yeah. all do it. We all do it. No matter the level of. Success, I agree I with you, and that's the funny thing. Um, it's like uh, you know, it's like the lonely model. You know, oh, she must have a million dates, and then sometimes it's like no one asks me out because they all think I'm taken. You know, <laughs> it's like we. It's just it doesn't matter who you are. You got this. So okay, so I, yeah, I was thinking about this. 
I don't want to do this in a the, the, the traditional linear way. I, I just have these these okay. points of curiosity, uh-huh. right? I love One it. One of them was, um, who do you who do you admire as a speaker? Like, who do you really admire? Okay, so I was I was sitting with this question because there's a I don't feel like I have any one person that I really admire, but I will say. When I see speakers who take some risk and do things differently. Um, So, for example, Amanda Palmer, I feel, is a really amazing speaker. She has, she's also an artist, but she does things differently. She takes risk. John Bohannon is another person I watched his TED talk, and he hired a dance troupe to communicate why we don't need PowerPoints, right? So, it's people who, take a different approach towards speaking and how they're showing and educating or inspiring their content. And those are the people I admire. I don't care if it's a total fail. You did something different to get our attention. I feel that the speaking community has become very homogenized personally where there's a cadence to it. And so when someone gets up on that stage and they they change the way we're supposed to hear something and receive something, that is amazing to me. Those are the people I admire because it's not easy to do because we are so conditioned to do things the same way because it does work, but it's it's not disruptive. I like people who disrupt. That's really great. I, I was thinking the direct applicability of that point to like social media content creation because it's, you know, it's like, yeah, it, it just becomes grist for the mill. You know, if you're trying to like, okay, I got to do these posts and okay, I got to do it like they do it. And, it, you know, I mean, you learn from other people, but it, it has to be you at a certain level, like deeply you is it, right. Because you're different. You're unique. Yes. You know, you, every year you, yes. right? Is that the point? You're unique. So, yeah. Yes. And every year you change. I don't know about you, but I am not the same person I was last yeah. year or three years ago or obviously not the year of Marsha Johnson. Right. right? I've changed. Um, I feel, oh, I had a thought and I just, it just mm. escaped my brain. Okay. There. See, you can, oh, it was the social media stuff. I feel like a lot of people, they, they, because they think they have to do it a certain way, they just don't do anything. And that is such a missed opportunity. I, so I'm on TikTok. I have found a great community on TikTok. I do absolutely nothing fancy on TikTok. I literally am just talking into the camera like I am with you right now. That's it. But so many people have an idea in their head that they have to be clever and witty and with multiple edits and cuts and different characters and all the things and the music. And you don't. You just have to show up you in the way that you feel comfortable showing up. Mm. Like you said. It's an inside game. It's like cultivate, cultivate yourself and then express that. And if you're trying to go for the external first without getting connected with who you really are. If I'm, if I'm trying to model somebody else, I can't be my full self. And if I'm not my authentic self, yeah. then it's it's not gonna be disruptive because it's gonna be basically a cheap copy of somebody else's presented identity. Yeah. Yeah, I always say to clients, I say, look, for those people that you admire who are great speakers or those people on social media that are showing up, instead of looking at how they're doing it and doing what they're doing, Just ask yourself the question, what are the qualities of that person that I admire? What are the qualities? And then maybe try on a quality. And that quality could be as simple as, I really like how they walk into a room with confidence. It's a great quality in that person. Great. Then walk into a room with confidence. See how it feels in your body and keep doing it until it feels like you. That is some great advice. (laughs) Okay, so you talk about being a number of things. So you're helping people with their ability to influence, their ability to persuade, Mm -hmm. their ability to be, and a tool to be persuasive 
and influential is to be clear. And we've talked about being confident. Let's unpack each of those as separate things for a second. Because okay. you know, okay. we're all throwing around these words, these, you know, and like in the in the in the I workforce know. space, you know, engaged engagement, psychological safety. I mean, they're all distinct and interrelated. And so it can get actually kind yeah. of confusing because they've just become these kind of platitudinal words that if we haven't defined them. So help me define what what it is from your as a as a speaker. How do I grapple with those purposes and those words? Which one do you want to start well, with? Well, okay. I the, I mentioned four. Influence, persuasiveness, clarity and confidence. What do you what stands out for you as the logical first thing? Let's talk about clarity Great. first. That was the first one. So there's a there's a little phrase that I love to say, which is clarity is kindness. That's it. Clarity is kindness. So the more clear you can be and the more concise you can be, you're gifting your audience something. And that's kindness, which is it's kind to be clear so they re they can understand what you're sharing and they don't feel left out of the conversation. That's just a kind act. Uh and oftentimes I work with a lot of people in technical industries. And so it's very difficult to take what they're so passionate about and so good at and to reduce it to a more simple way of, sh of sharing it to their audiences. And so, for example, if, a, if you're an engineer and you're designing uh, a solution and you're sharing and revealing the architecture and how and all those features that get to that solution, we as the audience, you, you start to lose us if we're especially like a, you know, a, a lower level audience. And I mean that like in terms of where our expertise lives, you, ne you need to be able to communicate that to us in a more simplified way. We don't care about all the features. We just want to know what the solution is to the problem that we're currently having. And the other piece about that too is that, and I think this is gonna now start tying into all of those other questions that you have and those other, but it's also bringing in the humanness to it, which is the persuasion, the persuasion piece, which is you need to have those equal parts. And I'm sure you can speak into this on a leadership level too, is that you have to have you know, the word that we always throw around authenticity, to me, that's showing up with your true self and spirit. And then you need to have the empathy piece, which is that you do understand your audience and perhaps you weave in some of the words that you think your audience might be using to define something so that you can show that you understand them. And then there's the logic piece, but most presentations, technical or not, mostly live in logic. That's it. And so it, it's hard to be persuasive when there's no emotional connection. Okay. And how is influence distinct from that, if it is? I mean, let me, let me tell you from where I'm coming from on that word. To me, influence is just pretty uh, agnostic. I can influence you to do anything, mm -hmm. right? I, my poor behavior yeah. could influence, I'm influencing you regardless. I might influence you to leave this conversation <laughs> depending on what I do, right? It may not be my intention, but I, to me, influence without a clear intention um, and expressly a positive intention then isn't getting me where I want to go. So influence is, I mean, Hitler was very influential. I mean, it's like, you, you know, he was inspiring right. too by the way. So, I mean, we need to be careful about like the positive intention that we have, but I was wondering in your world. So it, it means nothing to me until I add some more stuff to it is at least for me. So, I mean, I'm what, what does it mean to you? And what are the thoughts that you have about when you talk about influence with your clients, for example? Well, influence, I feel this is a great, I love this, this conversation so far. So influence to me, as I hear you define it and the way that I hear it and see it is Influence is about integration. And if you're if you're not presenting material in a way to where people can leave and actually remember and integrate, there's no action behind it, then it's really difficult to say if you've been an influencer or not. Does that mm. make sense? Like I'm not even gonna say influencer. I think influencer is very different. Well, it thing. now is, yeah, certainly. <laughs> yeah. Now it is. Yeah. Now it is. I'm saying there's an opportunity that I think is often missed, which is 
you can share really amazing wisdom, but if you don't put it into action or have people discuss it, like the teach the teacher model or uh, have them, like I do highly engaging and interactive workshops because I want people to get a sense of what it feels like in their bodies. Because if they integrate it in that way and they can share in that way, then I have influenced them in a way to where hopefully by giving the right tools can carry it into their day-to-day life. And I feel the influence also comes into the places where sharing with people in this, that intentionality piece, like how is this applicable? Why is this important? And then now tell me how you're going to use it. I feel like is it missed opportunities in a lot of talks. So I, that's bringing up for me social media again, because that's such a channel now. And it's like, I love how you're further defining it, that my purpose needs to be to essentially my influence is to help you take an action that's meaningful, that will add value to your life, your career, your whatever it is, in whatever context. It doesn't have to be professional, certainly. Yeah. And so when I think about being influential, I, I need to go deeper than that one degree of you, you looked at me for 20 minutes, <laughs> right? I influenced you to like come to my talk, right? It's got to yeah. be, yeah. Um, I want to see a tale of my influence in your life that's meaningful to you. And that's the measure of successful influence. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, we, I feel like we do. We have a responsibility. We have to be careful when when things become buzzwords, um, they lose meaning. And so I feel like, yeah, as, as a coach, it's important for me to redefine what they mean and then to ha- to make sure my clients also understand what it means for themselves. Like, what does that mean? That you, what, what do you mean you want to show up authentically? What does that mean to you? Yes. And sometimes it's like, what does it mean to you in this context with this person or this audience? Because it might be different influencing audience A. I mean, I I was thinking of someone who's like a shock person, right? And and on its face, you're like, oh, that's kind of a negative way to influence people. And I'm going to shock you. I'm going to just. But if but I could see a context where the point of me, there have been comedians like this where my my job in here is to come in and shock you into disrupting your previous pattern of thinking about something. And on its face, it may look rude, it may look nasty, but if you walk away from this and start questioning in that quiet part of your soul how you have viewed a certain issue, I've done my job. And maybe you'll still hate me, yes. but I will have influenced you. And that is not necessarily my tactic may look dirty on the outside or may look not very nice, but it, 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 you know, there's a wide swath of ways to get there. I mean, you know, there's certain people who over time we look back on them and they they go, wow, they were really impactful. And they, they took a lot of slings and arrows for the way they did it, but it was actually great. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's like history will tell, right? right? And, and the opposite, <laughs> how someone, too. How I mean, someone it, hasn't, yeah, and the opposite. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay. What are some patterns you've noticed? Because you work with, a, I'm imagining you work with, a. you've talked about engineers and, you know, I have some experience there, too, like EQ for engineers. You know, it's like, uh, how do you translate uh, technical things to a non-technical audience, things like that. Um, what are the types of people, the range of people that you work with? And actually, let me back up. There was another question that came to mind as I was meditating on this. Okay. When we talk about speaking or being a speaker, so the verb form or the noun form, whichever one, what are we talking about? What what what's the range? And when you think of working with a speaker, what is the range of context that you think of? Because some people might say, "I'm not a speaker." Yeah. Oh, it's a lot. It's a anytime you're called to speak. You're a speaker. So it could be on social media. It could be in a podcast. It could be an internal presentation. It could be a customer facing presentation. It could be a story slam. It could be uh, an audio room. Anywhere that you're being called to use your voice. It could be in a meeting. It's we are speakers all the time. I can't tell you all the different scenarios people have come to me with very widely. Uh, 
And I let on camera is, is not, you know, a lot of people are now having to do more YouTube videos for their work or explainer videos about their new products for their clients. Like there's, ev- there's places <laughs> we're always speaking. Yes. So if you're a sentient being and you operate in the world at all, you're a speaker. Is that the point? I believe so. If yes. And even more so these days. Right. right. Even more so. Okay. I think that's really important because one of the audiences that I'm hoping to help with these conversations is are, is or are, I'm having a grammar problem, Um, the early career professionals and new managers in particular. So someone who's managing for the first time, they're, they're, you know, they've got a manager title and really what they need to do is become a a leader (laughs) and and that's the hardest part. Yeah. It's always the people. And so they might be thinking, well, I'm not a speaker. I mean, I'm not up on a stage with the little microphone and the lights and the cameras. And it's like, no, you you are. You, you, are you having leadership team meetings? Are you having team meetings? Are you having conference calls? Mm-hmm. Are you? That's being a speaker yep. in, in your definition. Oh, it definitely is. Because you're you are called to hold the space holding space are you you're called okay to hold you're space. called to hold yeah. space so are you ever called to hold a space is the question if if the answer is yes you are a speaker a hundred percent okay yep and so now yeah. it's like yeah now it's how do you communicate how mm-hmm. do you how do you get your needs met okay so Let's talk about that through the channel of some patterns that you've noticed working with people across personalities, across uh, ex- areas of expertise, industries, cultural differences. What are the, have you noticed any themes like that are just common to the human experience around speaking, which is broadly defined in terms of the biggest fears, the biggest gaps in awareness, the biggest opportunities for improvement right now? Okay, yes. One is uh, everyone has a narrative in their head that there's never enough time. So what happens is people don't practice and then they wonder why they weren't as effective as they could have been. People are amazing at overcomplicating. It's very difficult to be simple. It's very difficult to do simple. Uh, so my job is to give you the roadmap. And then I would say the missed opportunity, the biggest one is that everyone, I f- the leadership is modeling. Oftentimes I feel, feel like it's a trickle down. Leadership models, this is how this is supposed to be done. And so then everybody starts to do it the same way that the leader is modeling it or the people on their team or their manager is modeling it. And so we we start, everything start, and I alluded to this already, but everything starts to sound the same. Everything starts to sound the same. People stop going to meetings. I just had a, I had a great call with a client yesterday and we had the same discussion. I said, who says you can't have fun? Who says you can't create an experience for your team when you're presenting this new product that you rolled out and they need to know about it and you need to educate them about it? And I asked him this question. I said, do you like to host parties? He's like, I love hosting parties. And I said, I said, amazing. I said, so are you a shoes off? kind of guy or a shoes on kind of guy? Are you playing music when they walk in? Are you handing them a cocktail or are you giving them? How do you want to present the space? How do you want people to feel when they come to your place for a party? You're the host. And I say that same thing to my clients. You get to host this party. You get to create whatever experience you want to create for your audience. And but what you're doing, you're choosing not to. You're choosing to just do it the same way the last person just did it. And so there's there's no differentiation. I don't know why this is coming up for me, but it's it's like branding everything, using the same slide deck uh, template for everything. Oh. All right. It's like, it's like yes, creativity it. killers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I always say you need to know your content well enough because you are the expert that if all of your tech failed you and it will. You could still you can do that presentation yeah. without it. Yeah. 
Wow. Okay. What other patterns? What other common issues do you see that come up that where people are like, oh, the pennies dropped. I finally got it. I didn't know that. I feel a lot of it's around structure. That That's the big one where people really don't have a structure. They basically will take their slide deck and create kind of something so that they have it to present the next day. That's that's one thing that when you give somebody structure, and I always say this in improv too, improv has structure, right? We ha- I, I know exactly like here's the beats I'm supposed to hit and everything in between I'm making up, but I know where I'm supposed to be going. It's the same when you're presenting, but oftentimes people don't have a simple structure. Uh, the aha moments, this is in the call to action. So many people go, at the call to action, like, oh, that wasn't clear because why wasn't it clear? Well, you had five. You had, you had, you wanted them to, to, you know, find you on LinkedIn. You wanted them to download this thing. You wanted them to go to this other session. You wanted them to know your email address. Like it's, it's like um, an overwhelm of like, what do you need me to do as an audience? So, so when you, when you tell them like, just give them one call to action. So, so and don't give them the, a don't yeah. give them a personalized Legend of Zelda routine. Uh, go find the secret no. chalice and get the medical kit, and then come back and I'll tell you the next thing to do. Yeah, but only but if you're only on my if mailing you're list. On my mailing list, yeah. <laughs> so that's that's one thing. Um, and then oh, there's I mean there's it's funny that you ask that because I don't think it's any one thing. It's it's multiple things that I feel. Uh, and that's what's so c- cool. Oh, and then, okay. The other aha moment that I will say is that people don't have to start their presentations with a salutation Ah, and who they are. That's a big aha for people. Well, what do you mean? That's what, wh- how am I supposed to think the, the event planner and how am I supposed to, I'm like, there's ways you can weave those things in. That they and they don't need to be at the beginning. And I give this like analogy: like imagine you go to a Broadway show. Imagine you go see The Lion King, and imagine you just paid your three hundred dollars for you and your partner to go watch The Lion King, and you sit down and you're excited for the show to start. And uh, the first thing that happens is like some like some dude walks up on stage, and he's maybe the stage manager, and he's like, "Hey, thank you all so much for coming to The Lion King tonight." We're so glad you're here. My name is Joe. I'm the stage manager. So I'm going to be calling all the cues backstage. You know, like, can you imagine if you showed up and that's how a show started? But it doesn't. You you show up and it's like the curtains unfold and the music swells and like a spectacle starts. Like something happens. It's engaging you. It's hooking you. And so I share with my clients, it's your, I'm not asking you to be a performer but there is a performative element to a presentation. You need to hook us in. You need to ask us a question. You need to tell us a story. And that is, and then you can tell us who you are for the credibility piece. Just a little bit though. We don't need your whole resume. And then get to the point. And sometimes you don't need it at all because they've already read it. No, Your bio's there. That's the reason they came are. like, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, you, you'll you notice we and, didn't start with that either oh, in this conversation. <laughs> we did not. Well, and the other aha, I love, you're so smooth. And the other aha moment that people have is like, um, and mostly if, if I can get, and this was great, I had one company that I was working with and marketing was in the training with me, which was fantastic. Because then I just said, you don't need all of this text on your slides. You just don't need it. And then the they will always say in rebut, which is, but I need to send this to the VP or to leadership before the meeting, or it's going to be archived on the company website and people need to be able to read it and have a comprehensive understanding of what we shared here today. And I said, well, that's awesome. Then have two decks, one that you present and one that has all of that information that is needed for them to understand the context. And they're, it's like their mouths dropped. Oh, <laughs> Like, but we don't need that in your audience. The audience does not need all that text. We we've lost you've lost us. When the second that slide comes up, I've my attention is broken. It's split. Isn't that the contract of a presentation? 
is that I'm going to give you my attention right now in order to be fed a meal or given information in a way that's different, that's focused, that's entertaining, that's in, in, because I'm going to go back into that world that where I'm being pinged and constantly barraged with fragments of information. But for this 10 minutes, 30 minutes or an hour, I'm kind of, I'm all yours. If you earn it, I'll stay with you. And that's what's so rare yeah. about those moments, especially now, because we're all just barraged with spam phone calls all day. And, you know, you're just trying to keep, I mean, just trying to be present in 2024 is harder than ever. So it's really a special opportunity oh, that you're giving yeah. them. It's a refuge. It is. Okay. It is. Okay. I love Moira from Schitt's Creek, and you've written about Moira. Now, Moira is fabulously ignorant. She is so fabulously ignorant. Uh, tell me what we... What we what can we learn from Moira on Schitt's Creek? And for those of you who don't know what Schitt's Creek is or Moira, just do yourself a favor. Look up Schitt's Creek on Google. Watch watch a YouTube clip of Moira. She is fantastic. She's also willfully ignorant, I would say, in legal terms. Uh, what do we learn about public speaking or speaking? And what, what does Moira have to teach us about being a great speaker? <laughs> Oh my goodness, I love that you're asking me these questions. I'm like, what did I write? Doesn't matter. What's coming up for you <laughs> now? Right Life's now. one big improv. Oh my God, she's unapologetically her. It's just she's it's just brilliant. Like she and there's ignorance is bliss. Like just be, just be. Um I I feel like that her character is just so compelling and you just want to love her because she just is. And I think that's so difficult for people to be is unapo unapologetically themselves because we're told, right? We hear voice, like I can hear voices in my head right now, like you're too much or you're not enough, or you talk too much here, or you do, you don't, we, he, we have all these voices in our head. And I feel that the gift we can give ourselves is to just block it out. Like everyone has an opinion and everyone's opinion is different than the last person's opinion. And so the best thing you can do is trust your heart and your gut and all that other crap that lives in your head. You can just dismiss it to just show up uh, because our intuition is a, a very powerful force. And I feel like that's what she just does in that show. She, certainly she just does. intuitively trusts gut yeah. and heart. Yeah. And you've, you've written about the role of, you know, having some Moira, but pairing that with curiosity that, you know, ignorance yeah. works for you. Yeah. Ignorance can be bliss. And talk about the role of curiosity yeah. and making that ignorance not hurt you, but help you, if that makes sense. Mike, the, the one question I have always loved is what else? What else? What else? What else? So you might start with something like a line on a piece of paper and you can go, oh, what else? And then you do a squiggle and you're like, oh, what else? And then you draw a circle. What else? Oh, maybe I'm going to take some a, a green marker and put something. So it's all it's like always asking and being curious and questioning how as a speaker can I grow? What else is there? What else can I read? Who else can I watch? What else can I do in this moment? What else can I do to help engage more effectively with my audience? So yes, definitely leaving that open mind and heart to possibility and leading with curiosity, I think is so incredibly important. Okay, for that is a tangible and fantastic piece of advice. Now, I usually at the end of this, I ask, what are three things that a new manager can do right now without any assistance on their own? to improve their ability in whatever realm. And we're talking about as a speaker now in whatever capacity. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna chalk that up to the number one because I, I think it's brilliant. And also on the feedback side, I think that really plays well with feedback because if you're wondering what kind of question to ask your colleague, one simple one is what else could I do? Yeah. You know, I'm not asking you so to take simple. a risk and criticize mm -hmm. me. But I will ask, you know, because maybe you're not comfortable doing that. But if I say, what else would have made that great? Or what else could we do next time? It's like, oh, well, you could do, you know, great party. 
uh, adding some chocolate cake would have made me even more delighted, you know, or whatever it is, you know, or ha- having us take our shoes off would yeah. have made me even more delighted. By the way, I'm a shoes off right. person, just too many years in Japan. Okay. Um, we've only got a couple minutes left. So you've already nailed the first of the three that I would ask you. What are two other things that, you know, a new manager, or if you're not a new manager and you like these, please do, please do borrow them. What are two other quick tips that someone could do right now to improve their clarity, confidence, influence, persuasiveness, or, or whatever other quality about their speaking? Listening. I feel good speakers are incredible listeners. And that circles back to what we were talking about at the beginning, which, which is the connection piece. Because what you're truly doing here is you're listening long enough so that you can feel. Mm. There's, I, I went to a Buddhist inspired school uh, and we would do, we would bow in for every class. And so a lot of that was like, it was the hold, which was the listening and then the feel and then the bow. And so I would encourage leadership to also hold, that's the listening, then feel and then act rather than uh, act first. Great, great, listen, yes. And pause. You got to pause. Yeah. Pause. Okay. What's yes. the, any any third yeah. one? That's a, that's a third lot. one. Please have fun. Like bring joy into leadership. We can smile. I know some of the topics that we have and that the things that we're doing and initiatives in the world are challenging and can be difficult. But we've got to be able to find the joy. Mm. We have to find the joy. We have to bring laughter and joy into our workplaces and play. I, I could not agree more. That is a hundred and it's harder than it sounds. It's so it's, it's funny. I yeah. know we've done something in our yeah. society to kind of, kind of ground that out or tell the wrong message. Yeah. Listen, we're out of time for now. Every time I've spoken with you, I've walked away feeling more curious, more inspired, more better off in, in tangible and intangible ways. So I think people who listen to this are going to feel the same way. And I'm just really grateful for your presence and generosity in this conversation. Thank you. Same here. Let's, I I feel like we should just uh, continue this conversation for a few more hours another time. We'll call this part one, part one. Thank Thank, you. Thank you, Meredith. This part one, part one. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you got value out of this conversation. And if you did, make sure to hit that subscribe button on whatever channel you're listening. And join me at our Substack channel, mattstone.substack.com. That's mattstone.substack.com. Subscribe there as well for more bonus material and other things of value. And of course, remember, sharing is caring. So please share this show with a friend. Until next time. 